The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Today's message, and we need this, I need this, you need this, we all need this. Holy expectation, write that down, because in the days ahead, it's going to manifest in your life. Holy expectation. What in the world is holy expectation? Well, first of all, I'm going to preach the verse that we don't get preached very often. James chapter 1, verse 2. Page 1228 in the It's Supernatural Bible, large print, small print, you can't follow the page in your Bible. In your Bible, it's, it's going to be in uh, James, our Bible, it's going to be Jacob, okay, chapter 1, verse 2. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Look to the person next to you and say, you don't do that. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, wait a minute. This is the Word of God. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How many? I think I need to dedicate again, don't you? I think I better start with lesson one. To love the Lord my God with all my heart. No, seriously, this is Christianity 101. Now, listen to this. Knowing that the testing of your faith will work endurance, it will produce something. So, considering it pure joy that I'm facing various trials, I don't know. When I face trials, I, the first thing that doesn't pop up is joy <laughs> or laughter or amusement in any form. It's basically, oh. But you know, I want to give you, for that scripture to be real, it's not in there to be theory. It was in there to be experienced. How in the world do you experience that? Well, I'm going to use me as an example. I'll go easy on you folks. I'm going to show you that what the obstacle to that verse of scripture, the obstacle to consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials, I'm going to go from Dennis's life and what God had to work in me. First of all, there's three enemies that will steal your joy, that will keep you from even responding to trials, negative things, in a proper way. And the first one is basic negativity. The second one is temper tantrums. And the third one is meltdowns. Uh-oh. So these are obstacles to consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials, that the testing of your faith is going to produce something good, fruit, endurance. So these three negative things. Negativity had to be purged out of Dennis when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and I felt a joy inexpressible and full of glory, it was an experience that I didn't even know was available. The joy of the Lord experienced when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I did not know that there was such a realm existed. It was a brand new experience. But the first argument after feeling this joy that I never knew existed before, this joy inexpressible and full of glory, the argument started in my head immediately with my Catholic background, of course. It added a little bit to it. it went, this can't be God. This joy, you don't deserve this. You're not worthy. This is for popes and cardinals and bishops. You see my little bit of Catholicism in there? This is not for people like you, former drug addicts, scum of the earth. You're imagining this joy. And I'm going, 
well, if I'm crazy, I want to stay this way. So this argument's going back and forth. You're negative. You don't think you're worthy. But on the other hand, something happened with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Somewhere along the line, something's got to give here. And I chose joy. <laughs> I chose whatever this experience in God is. This is so fulfilling. It gives me a, 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 a it just dealt with the negativity. All of a sudden it was, it, it's not about what I think I deserve or what I think I'm worth or my value. I am a new creation. Now here's the definition that applies to every one of you, but not necessarily has it really taken root in our hearts. A new creation is something that never existed before. It's new and it's spiritual. And that new creation loves God and loves His Word. Well, I'm not going to go any farther than that until you agree with that definition. The new creation you, the born again you, loves God and loves His Word. You're sure of that? But then somehow you're going to have to go through the same three <coughs> removal of barriers. One, negativity. That's not God. God is a God of hope. And negativity has to go in some way, shape, or form. And you know what I did that worked for me? And we teach this even in our self-deliverance courses. When I hear something that doesn't sound like God, it's intrusive, negative, condemning. That's not me. And believe it or not, just saying that makes a distinction that you can deal with it more effectively. You don't own it. You don't hang on to it and dwell on it. You deal with that negativity. The second thing was I was Dennis the Menace growing up, and uh, I think my bad behavior for a, a, a large degree, the Dennis the Menace part, was basically to get attention. I was ignored by my father, so, you know, bad, bad behavior gets attention. <laughs> Might not be the best kind of way because you can get hurt like that, but nonetheless, I had to, in God, under this new transition of this new creation, break, break the tempter tantrums. And at first, I carried it over the way I would treat my mom and dad was the way I was treating God. And I'd have a temper tantrum and justified it by saying my temper tantrum is to show God how serious I am about this issue. I thought that was a pretty good reason. Hey, you know what? I'm really upset. And the reason I'm having this temper tantrum is I'm telling God how really upset I am, just in case it, he overlooked how upset I really was. And then I got a vision that never left. I saw the Lord reaching out to me with loving hands, and I was claiming God was giving me the backhand or he was punishing me. No. You know what Dennis was doing? In his temper tantrum, he was bouncing up and down under the loving hands of God. So... Dennis was hitting himself with the backhand of God. I know it's a crazy picture, but it worked for me. Uh, Dennis was jumping up and down on the backhand of God, blaming God for giving him the backhand. When he said, I'm trying to reach out to you. I've never withdrawn my hands from you, Dennis. Dennis the menace. I've never done it. But you've got to come to me. You've got to come to the end of this behavior. I'm not going to change, but I can't do anything that I want to do with you until you change. And then I saw that my temper tantrums, even though I was expressing myself, was really building strength, the wrong kind of strength. It was fortifying so that I would have more temper tantrums. And guess where those led to? Meltdowns. Anybody ever have a meltdown? I can remember doing the meltdown. Sometimes we forget these things after many years, but this was spirit-filled Christian, walking in visions, dreams, revelations, seeing people healed, and then I would get bummed out, and I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to lie, so I called up, and I would get on the phone and say, I can't come in today, I'm sick. And that wasn't totally true. I am sick. Then I'd hang up and go, tired, sick and tired. 
I've justified it that way until I got convicted. That's sinning. <laughs> so somewhere along the line, you got to stop with these meltdowns. You're missing out on life. And the longer you stay in it, the more fortified it gets in your life. So those were my three obstacles. Negativity, temper tantrums, and meltdowns. And if you're still having them, you need consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. But the testing of it, but I'll tell you how it manifested later. Jennifer noticed it when we first got married. What did Dennis always say? When everything that could go wrong does go wrong, Dennis would say something good's coming. That's how that worked in you if you let it work in you. Okay? If you let it work in you, there will be a transformation that takes place to where there is a new attitude that comes from the heart and your perspective changes toward life. So making a distinction, that's not me, that's, that's a good thing. You know, there's simple distractions, but you give power to what you give attention to. You want to give attention to a, a temper tantrum, you will give power to it, you will strengthen it. You give attention to God's Word, and you will give power to it, and it will, it will begin to move more effectively in your life. All right? Then there's the repetitive ones. Anyone ever stay up and lose sleep over a repetitive thought? We learn to test those thoughts. How do you test it? First of all, you test the spirit of it, you know. Uh, <clears throat> does it feel condemning, accusatory, intrusive? You know, there's a, there's a spirit, an emotion behind every thought. So if it's condemning, if it's accusatory, it flunks the test, doesn't it? You love God and love His Word. So that'd be the second test. Is it scriptural? You know, most people that are believers are losing sleep over things that are not scriptural. If it's not scriptural, why are you hashing it out? Do you think you're going to resolve it? Thirdly, take that thought and carry it to the nth degree, that thought that's keeping you up at night. Carry it to the nth degree and say, what kind of fruit would that produce if I just did it? You get stuff like, I'm worried about my daughter, I'm worried about my daughter. Oh, I can't sleep, I'm worried about my daughter. Uh, I'm worried about my daughter. If you carry that far enough, it's going to be, when I get up, I'm going to kill that girl. All right? That, that fruit is not sanctified, is it? All right? And God's basically saying those simple categories of thoughts can be dismissed. They're not the new creation you. They can be tested. And you can pull them down if you deal with the emotion behind the thought. All right? Now, <clears throat> what is that scripture? My brothers, consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials, that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Because in this world, you're going to have tribulation. I think it would be wise that we would learn how to handle it. Jesus said, be of good cheer. The message translation says, be of good cheer, for I've removed its ability to harm you. So if it harms you, whose responsibility is that? That's yours. So God's basically saying, I want to consider pure joy. I want to bring us into a place of this holy expectation. And Jennifer learned right off the bat that somehow over the years, by dealing with these things over and over again, Practice makes permanent. You've heard practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent. When you receive the word, the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul, you practice it, it becomes easier to express it than to not when you own it, when you're a partaker of that divine nature. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I want to uh, read you a verse of scripture. Uh, we did this on a Tuesday night, and Boy, I tell you what, probably you should do it someday on a Sunday. This portion of Scripture, first, I mean, 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 and 4. You really want to see a changed life, pay attention to what I'm about to say here because it's giving you a how-to. What do you do with Scriptures like consider it pure joy? What do you do? You usually ignore them. Why are they in there? Well, I'll tell you, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. 
It tells you why it's in there. And we need to be reminded of why these scriptures are in there. They're not in there because they're so hard I'm going to ignore it. They're in there so that you can become a partaker of the divine nature and you can escape the corruption that's in the world through the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now listen, the mess messianic believer's call. Well, who, who's that? That's you. In Jesus, this is your call. His divine power, whose power? His power. His divine power has given to us all things, say all things, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, wait a minute, you just told me a little while ago that you're a new creation that loves God and loves His Word. So you want to be a partaker of that divine nature. And God has provided it, He's, he's given it, everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. Oh, that will require intimacy. Through knowledge of Him who has called you by His own glory and excellence, by which He has given us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you might become partaker of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world. Did you ever wonder what those promises were there for? Because I've seen Christians who the minute they got saved, they, they had this eternal security and they just lived whatever way they wanted to. Then why give us promises? Why bother if all you do is ask Jesus to come in, get your life changed, and then do whatever you want from that point on? Why did He give us promises then? It would have been a waste of time. He gave us those precious promises to cause us to be a partaker of His divine nature and escape the corruption of the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's why the promises are there. So then, therefore, the promises are the answer. Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. Of testing. Why is that scripture in there? Because if you learn to appropriate that, you become a partaker of the divine nature, and you start getting an attitude about, wow, everything's falling apart, something good's coming. And you learn to endure with a holy expectation of what God's going to do. Wow, I wonder what God's up to. First time he taught me that, I had $12.50 in my checking account. I was dirt poor and the transmission went out. And I went, wow, I wonder how God's going to work this out. Transmission, that's an expensive thing. And there was a, a company called Marentians Transmissions down the street. And I said, I'm t I was so full of the love of God and the belief that my God is able to do. Well, I, I'm driving it. It'll still drive, but there's something seriously wrong with it. And I drove it down the Marentians. And he says, no problem. It was something about uh, changing the fluid or something, stuff I didn't understand what he was talking about. But it was a bottle of stuff that he put in it. Does that make sense there back there, Daniel? I don't know. This is an old junker. But it, it was, <laughs> he's a foreman in a, at, at Ford Motors. So we know it. I, uh, if I say anything agricultural or, or mechanical, just slap me because I, I don't usually know what I'm talking about. I'm a city boy, I don't understand farming, and I don't understand mechanics. But anyway, I, in my ignorance, I went and he put this stuff in, and all of a sudden it worked, and he said, the bill's $12. Whoa, I had a balance of 50-some cents in that checking account. I don't know if that was legal or not, but it worked. I wonder how you're going to work this out. If that got in your spirit as a lifestyle, I wonder how God's going to, how does he want me to respond when everything is falling apart? Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials, that the testing of your faith is going to produce something. But how does it work? I'm a how-to person. Don't give me some lofty scripture and don't do this to me. Don't just go, well, Dennis, you just keep quoting. Uh, you quote that scripture, consider it pure joy uh, when you face me. When I'm in a trial, I'm not going to say, consider it pure joy. I, I need reality. I don't need repetition. Hmm? I need experience, not information. I want revelation knowledge. I, I need at that point to be a partaker of the divine nature and escape the corruption 
of my mind, will, and emotions. Escape the corruption of my flesh. Escape the corruption of the world and its, its ideas. Escape the devil's tauntings and condemnations in my head. By golly, it says here, we have been given these exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, through these, by means of these, you become a partaker of that divine nature, that experiential knowledge of God. And when you partake, you escape. When you escape, you partake. I like that. That's not hard. It requires submission on my part to do it. I like that how-to. I have holy expectation. I have a holy expectation that I said, God, why is all of our technology getting old, corrupted, and in some cases doesn't even operate anymore, and there's no support system behind it because we got the free version instead of the pay version. Does this relate to anybody? <laughs> the free version was nice that it was free, but eventually there's no support behind it. So I'm going, I got to go to a higher power. I, I mean, I got to get, I got to get someone that's got some answers here. I got to go to Jesus. Jesus, what's going on? He says, I'm getting you upgraded and updated in preparation for an explosion. Okay, that's good for me. Wouldn't, wouldn't preparation be just logically be a prerequisite? To advancing, expansion, whatever. Wouldn't it? Organize before you expand. That's just a good business practice. So, thank you, Jesus, that some things got our attention by failing. As a matter of fact, when I started this message, anything of value I have to teach you, I learned by my failings. Dennis the Menace. Best life lesson in the world because you know what? When you do it wrong and then you do it right, you don't forget. All th it's good for your instruction, reproof. Hmm? Okay, so now, holy expectation. We're going to get there. How do I get there? Oh, my goodness. I've got to know how to test my thoughts. You know that. So... Consider it pure joy. Let's understand the enemy. You saw the enemy's tactic with me. Negativity, temper tantrum, and meltdowns. And my meltdowns lasted for several days. And some of you still do that. That should be done away with. You're wasting valuable time. Sick and tired. What a phony excuse. I'm sick and tired. I'm bummed out, is what I wanted to say, and I quit. How many people have ever quit? Well, what are you going to do when you quit? This, you should be like Peter. Where do I go now? If, if I quit Jesus, what do I do? All right. So consider pure joy. I want this holy expectation. But we do need to understand the way the enemy works. In Daniel chapter 7, I think there's a key that I've always noticed. In Daniel chapter 7, 25, it says that the, that the evil people would speak against the Most High God. He would speak blasphemies against God and wear out the saints of the Most High God or the Holy Ones or the saints. What was the strategy then? He would blaspheme God and try to wear you out. Well, I'm saying to have this holy expectation, you can't be a sucker for being worn out. You're going to have to learn how that is not to work in your life. If you're prone to being worn out, it reminds me, I can't remember which of the ites, but there was the ites that used to attack uh, the children of Israel. I don't remember which ite. They're all bad. <laughs> but there was an ite that, that wasn't that they were so... Uh, extremely powerful, but they just never stopped. It was just constant. Everybody been bombarded with something constant? It doesn't have to be strong if it's constant. It can wear you out. It can bum you out, right? Well, how do you stop that? You have to realize that it's getting stronger, that you give power to what you give attention to. 
You've got to make the distinction that that's not me. The new creation me loves God and loves His Word. Anything I hear in my head, I am not going to own it. And, it's, and even to the point where I used to get weary in, in my congregation of periodically people coming up and saying, I'm not worthy. I used to end up saying, you're not. <laughs> All right, you're not worthy apart from Him. You can do nothing. Straighten up. <laughs> because it was, a, it was just a pity party. I'm not worthy. It comes from pride. Poor me. Oh, stop with the poor me. Apart from him, you can do nothing. That's why you're a new creation. Tell me your identity again. Oh, you love God and love his word. Oh, okay. Now that's the real you. We need to be talking to the real you. God really desires a breakthrough in strength in a time of sorrow and grief. If you're in a place of sorrow and grief, God is actually desiring from you that new creation you. He wants to see a breakthrough. That's really what He wants for you. He doesn't want grief and sorrow. He wants you to get the breakthrough in the grief and the sorrow. He wants you to get to the place where you be basically don't Give in to the enemy who wants to wear you out. Here's another example. Judges 16. Samson and Delilah. You know that story? Samson, Samson had supernatural strength. It was in his hair. And Delilah was this manipulative woman that he thought he loved. Which goes to show you, even the mighty don't know the difference between love and lust. <laughs> Needs discernment, doesn't it? He thought he loved her, but she said, but if you love me, how come these three times when I asked you what your strength was? Because I really want to do you in. But anyway, <laughs> how come I want my fellow Philistines to come and capture you? But if you love me, if you love me, even parents do that sometimes. Don't do that to your kids. If you love me, you would do such and such. Oh, so your love is conditional. But nevertheless, we won't go there. Uh, what happened to Samson was it says he got nagged to death because three times he hid the truth from her. Three times he hid the truth. And she goes, if you love me, you have, you're not telling me the truth. You're hiding it from me. And he was nagged to death. Does that sound like a constant onslaught? Nag to death. Nag to death. Wear out the saints of the Most High God. Right? He was nagged to death. What did he do when he was nagged to death? He made a bad choice. If you're getting nagged to death, don't make your choices without calling somebody that's got some wisdom. Yeah. All right? Because he made a bad choice, didn't he? How many know the story of Samson? It was a bad choice. He told her the secret of his strength. And man, I'll tell you what, he lost his strength. Now, what about Jesus? In Matthew 26, Jesus said, My soul was overwhelmed with sorrow and grief, even to the point of death. That's in Gethsemane. My soul was overwhelmed with sorrow and grief. This is Jesus. Even to the point of death. Yet, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's the breakthrough. And you have the capacity to do that. You have the grace of God. If you are desiring the precious promises and making that word become flesh. God is wanting a breakthrough in your times of trial. Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. Go, wow, wonder how God's going to get me out of this mess. Hope is opening your heart and not shutting down even when you don't have any facts. You don't have a plan. You don't have a strategy. Matter of fact, a lot of your plans and strategies actually interfere with the resolution that God has for you. Hope in God, not necessarily a certain outcome. Now, what God's basically saying is that there's a blessing on the other side of enduring a trial. So I'm not going to give you some kind of a, a, a soft sermon that says there's no trials in this world, da, 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 da. you know that's nonsense. But how you respond to them can make you the kind of person God called you to be. He wants to bless you on the other side of that trial. 
you get focused and off focused on the trial. But then you give power to what you give attention to. You need to make a distinction as something good's coming. You're going to have to start look, learning to look at the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I can remember God saying to, uh, uh, not only to test the thoughts, but there's a blessing on the other side of any attack or test. What he's looking for is your heart. And in James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed, happy, filled with joy is he who endures, for you shall receive the crown of life. There is a reward in enduring properly. Not enduring because of your sin, but <laughs> enduring because of righteousness sake. Maintaining the proper attitude of God confidence in the midst of I don't know what's going on. You give power to what you give attention to. I had a lady that was so far gone that her psychiatrist basically said the only thing that broke she, it broke in her, and it's kind of, I'm not bragging here, but the one phrase that I kept working with her, and she finally went to the psychiatrist, and he says, that's what broke it. You give power to what you give attention to. You want to hang on to something like a dog with a bone? It'll take you down. You want to hang on to the Word of God? It'll make you great. It'll give you breakthrough. It'll cause you to rise above circumstances and people. It'll cause you to have joy in the midst of and causing you to be Colossians 1.11 steadfast in circumstances and patient with people. Wow, would that be a miracle walk, wouldn't it? That's all of life. Steadfast in circumstances and patient with people. There's nothing left. You would be a gloriously joyful, victorious, abundant life, living saint, holy one. Now, so there, there's a blessing on the other side of these trials. There's a blessing on the other side of enduring, any attract or thing. And here, here's a nice definition of maturity. You, you are all called to mature. You are expected, just like your children, to grow up. And maturity, by definition, is to resist with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. To the degree that you resist with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, you mature. You escape the corruption that's in the world and you become a partaker of the divine nature. You escape, you partake. You partake, you escape. And how do you do that? The promises. They're not just in there for, to be cute platitudes. They were meant to be life to all of your flesh, to give life to you, experiential life. And they were to cause you to move forward and upward in the plan and the purpose that God has for you. Because He's called every one of you now, six keys in order to develop, to count it all joy. Okay, you're going to do all six of these or you're going to do one of them? You're going to do none of them. But here's six keys. And when I'm giving you keys, I'm talking they have to be lived out, obviously. But the starting place would be, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The next time you have a, a, a Bible believer talking about how the devil's beaten up on him, this truth right here is missing. Little children had a song, it's a big, big God and an itsy bitsy devil. That is actually a healthier theology than some mature Christians have. It's a big, big God and an itsy bitsy devil. Now, unless you make him big, you can make the devil big in your own eyes and you'll give power to what you give attention to. Secondly, faith totally leans on the person of Jesus and is totally aware of the impossibility of your human effort. Maybe you've got to come to that. Maybe you're still trying. You're wearing yourself out trying when you, the part of you still believes your human effort is going to do something. Apart from Him, you can do nothing. Jesus said, the words that I speak, I hear Him say. The, the things that I do, I only do what I see my Father doing. That kind of an abandonment to your own human effort is essential. The third element, perfect love casts out fear. When you yield totally to God in times of trials or attacks, His perfect love will cast out fear and insecurity. And I've had to come against, even in helping some Christians, work through something, some of the advice they're getting from other people that's called wisdom is really fear. 
oh, you better be careful. Oh. When somebody tells you you better be careful, and if it's got fear attached to it, that's not wisdom. The wisdom that comes from above is, first of all, peaceable, approachable, full of mercy, full of redemptive solution. If it doesn't have a redemptive solution, like, oh, well, you might as well just give up the ghost. Yeah, mm -hmm. just slit your wrist because it's over. You know, if somebody talks like that, where's that wisdom coming from? That's demonic. The wisdom that comes from above gives you hope, an anticipation, a holy expectation. Now, perfect love will purge fear and insecurity. And when you start getting involved in fear and insecurity, you need to see basically, I'm in the wrong kingdom. There is no fear or insecurity in the kingdom of God. And if I'm seeking first the kingdom, I'm seeking first the king, then fear has to go. And why would Jesus tell us, and why would scripture tell us from beginning to end, fear not, if that wasn't possible? That would be abusive, wouldn't it? To say fear not and then we don't have the capacity to get rid of it. The next element would be the molding of God works best in a broken and a contrite heart. So we have to bring the humility to where you say, I can't do this. But my God can because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And I remain off, open and soft to God. And in that, he shapes us. And he causes us to have... <laughs> oh, I, I still run into too many people who are trying to pray to get the devil off them. I'm in spiritual warfare. Get the devil off me so I can have a normal day. That never did compute with me. What they're asking for is no problems today is a normal day. No, for me... The supernatural day is to have everything go wrong and feel the joy of the Lord and feel like you're losing your mind that everything is so good. The sky is blue. The grass is green. Whoa. And everything's falling apart. If I'm crazy, I want to stay this way. That's the high calling. Knowing that in times of trials and attacks, Christ's likeness is what we should be working on, not get the devil off my back. Actually, you're giving him too much attention. So, you want that upward development. He wants you to pull you forward and upward to his heart till life is sweet and you're lost in God. I, used, I can remember scaring myself and then not taking in the fear when I would get enjoy my time in prayer and I would get lost in God and I would get this thought, what happens if you never come back? And I got scared. And then I went, I don't care. I got rid of that real quick. Perfect love. So, so I go, what, what if you got so lost in God you just went like Enoch? So? That'd be pretty good. So never be afraid you're going to get lost in communion with God. You're going to get too much God. You're not going to get too much God. Don't worry about it. Attempt it, though. <laughs> Attempt to overdo it. All right? Because that hunger for transformation, uh, up until now, any trial or attack, you count it all sadness. But I believe that now you're going to say, I cry out, I'm going to be satisfied when I awaken in his likeness because in this trial and everything, if I respond right, I am being... I am being uh, Delivered from corruption and a partaker of the divine nature. Is that a good exchange? Is that a good deal? Is that a good reward? He is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Diligence is not casual. Oh, well, if God wants me to, it'll fall on me. That's not diligence. Diligence is press on. It's even in the prophetic word I gave to Donna. I saw that it's your diligence that's being rewarded because you didn't give up. And you didn't care if there were obstacles because they were merely something that's going to be overcome. And it reminds me of the Apostle Paul. This is good for everybody, but I'm speaking to Donna right now. I really feel that what God, what Paul did was what all of us should do, and I believe you did it, Donna. He had a backward look, an inward look, an upward look, and a forward look. 
Forgetting those things are behind. Not that I've already attained. He was honest with the inside. Not that, but this one thing I do, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So he had a backward look, an inward look, a forward look, an upward look, and that's a healthy look. Because what are you doing? You're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. Your eyes are fixed. You give power to what you give attention to. If a woman who was seeing a psychiatrist could start to get set free simply by realizing she was giving power to something other than God and started to snap out of it, it'll work for you too. I've seen a woman who got turned around that they almost gave up hope on it. She was a believer, but she was, she was under psychiatric care. And she was convinced the CIA was coming in and injecting her during the day. And she was tying ropes onto her doorknobs to keep the doors closed. She had her own traps and systems set up and everything. But by and large, when you basically said, all right, I'll tell you what you do. When you think of those CIA people, what do you feel down in her gut? Fear. Massive fear. I said, receive forgiveness. You're a believer. Receive forgiveness for taking in that fear and release forgiveness to those CIA. Imaginary CIA. Well, what do you think about that? Dennis had her pray about imaginary people. Guess what you do? You're afraid of imaginary stuff all the time. You need the same advice. There's many things that you're afraid of that's not real. You need to deal with the fear. Forget whether it's real or not. You respond to God. She started getting better. I had a man come one time who thought he was Elijah incarnate. Mental health sent him to me. I had a Christian friend who was in mental health. I'm a baby Christian, two years old in the Lord. And they're saying, Dennis can do something with this guy. He believed he was Elijah. And when there was thunder outside, that's the only time God spoke to him and gave him direction. Oh, come on. This is somebody who's looking for help, though. He went for help. He needed help. <laughs> and I went, oh, Jesus, I'm a baby Christian. I'm going, oh, Jesus, what do I do? And the Lord just says, ask him if he's ever been wrong. So I went, oh. So I said, do you believe the Bible? <laughs> yeah, of course. It's the Word of God. I said, did you ever notice that apart from Jesus, all of the greats, including Elijah, <laughs> I had to throw that in there, because including Elijah, made mistakes and they were wrong. Is it possible you could be wrong? And he thought a long time on that and started to cry and said, I could be wrong. And they said he went back to mental health and they started seeing progress simply because he believed he could be wrong. How many of you need that? I know you like to be right. Some people are so right they're wrong. <laughs> but maybe what you really need is to admit that I could be wrong. Could be the beginning of a whole new sense of freedom in your Christian walk. So what is this holy expectation? Well, uh, uh, again, let's talk about what it's not. It is not, and I want you to say this back, it is not positive thinking. You can do that and not even be saved. Right? You can be a positive thinker and not be a saint. Holy expectation is basically a faith attitude that paves the way for God to move in your behalf. It comes by having the Word of God in our heart. And it's actually, experientially, it was the way I learned under, you know, they say the greatest of these is faith, hope, and love. I wanted to know, okay, hope, I don't want a concept. Because by definition, uh, that hope is a confident anticipation that I'm going to meet God. A confident anticipation that God is able. A confident anticipation that God's going to work it out somehow. And a confident anticipation that God is my source. And He's bigger than the devil. And so I said, so how do I work that out? And what the Lord showed me was, Dennis, when, when you don't have the answer, but you hold your heart open... He said, that's hope. Uh, hope? Hope is a confident expect openness that God is going to come through. I started to see that what I do in my head, though, is if I go, uh, I don't know, it's Thursday and nothing's happened. You can 
close the door of your heart. Hope deferred. It'll make you sick. It'll make you believe a lie. It'll frustrate you. It'll punish you. So what is hope then? Hope is the confident, open. Hope and open to me are synonymous. When you open your heart, you're in hope. If you stay open, regardless of external circumstances, love will come through. I don't like formulas, but you know what? It's kind of like faith is now, hope is open, and love never fails, so somehow it's going to come through. Experientially, then I have to learn how to stay open when nothing's going right. Not getting bummed out, not getting frustrated, that's flesh. I need to be escape the corruption of the flesh and partake of the divine nature. It's going to require me talking, acting, and thinking like a new creation me that says the real me loves God and loves His Word. If that's not the real you, then get rid of that you. <laughs> the real you loves God and loves His Word. You've got to resolve that once and for all. The real you loves God and loves His Word. And anything that's violating His Word will be an offensive thing to you. Actually, it's a good place for anger. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Hate that thing that's hindering the real you that loves God and loves His Word from expressing itself, from partaking of that divine nature. All right? So, it's an attitude. I love this in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. But this I recall, and therefore I have hope and expectation. It is of the Lord's mercies and loving kindness that we are not consumed because His tender compassions fail not, or His love fails not. His tender mercy fails not. The attitude of waiting hopefully and expectantly without taking matters into your own hands. I've seen more disasters of people who waited a certain amount of time for God to do something, and He didn't do it when they wanted, so they took matters into their own hands. A lot of Christians would rather do the wrong thing than nothing. Nothing requires you to trust in God. Doing something is for your flesh to feel like you're doing something. Very often you shouldn't be doing anything <laughs> until you're prompted by obedience from God. Now, here's another attack. Psalm 37 says, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for Him. Do not fret become because of Him who proffers, prospers in His way. The believer whose attitude waits patiently for God's timing has nothing to fear or nothing to be jealous about. But that's a legitimate temptation, isn't it? And I know if you're waiting for God to come through in a particular way and then you watch evil people and they look like they're prospering, <laughs> that could be irritating, had not it? It was for David. It's like, why did the wicked prosper? Look it, I'm going through this, and they're looking like nothing's happening. Until I considered the end. Oh. You know, I can still remember Bob Mumford using, using an example of this. The righteous, they get hit, boom. They get knocked down, but they get back up. The righteous get hit again, they get knocked down, but they get back up. And he did that over and over again, and finally he says, the unrighteous, they get knocked down. They're down for the count. There's no getting up. Though a righteous man fall seven times, he gets back up. That's the beauty. Learn from your mistake. Do something positive with the revelation that God's given you on how to respond properly. All right, I'm going to close with this. How to build this holy expectancy. You should already know how, but we're going to Repeat it again and again and again until it's second nature. First of all, if you want to build holy expectancy, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Somewhere along the line, and we're going to do, I want to do a series on hearing God. I really feel is necessary. Um, <clears throat> but if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, start with point number one. Hearing is vital. 
vital. You'd be surprised how significant that is. Take heed how you hear with the measure you use. Some people hear superficially and some people take it to heart. The ones that take it to heart, take heed how you hear because it's going to be measured to you. And some of the people that listen superficially for head information only, never applying it to the heart, even what they knew in their head eventually isn't going to work. It'll be taken away. And who's going to get more? The diligent, not the superficial. Say, I'm the diligent one. Say that. I'm the diligent one. Okay. The second thing, and when I discipled Jennifer when we first got married, I used to use the word cherish all the time. But I thanked God for every scripture that had a little bit more life than the rest of the scripture. That was God speaking to me. Quickened. All right? I never treated it lightly that if I'm reading and all of a sudden, to this day is still how I get a sermon. Holy expectation is what came out of a scripture for this message. And if you pay more attention to it, then God will develop it, not you. God will develop it. And I cherished it. And Jennifer says, I don't understand what you mean by cherish it. Because you could do that in your head. Oh, that's a wonderful word. That's a wonderful. No, cherished it was I would hold it here. Just like, just like a, 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 you, you, would, you would hold something that's precious near to you. Holding a little baby. By the way, I'm a grandfather again. Just thought I'd slide that in. Papa Clark, January 31st. Okay, for those watching by YouTube, they're going, what, what? What did that have to do with everything? I'm a grandpa. It has a lot to do with everything. All right. But when you hold that little baby, there's, a, there's, a, there's an, a feeling, isn't there? When you hold that little baby, you cherish it. You can't, even if words can't describe it, there's a bonding. Well, what God would do if, and I do this every day of my life, for my whole Christian life. Anything during my daily devotional that stands out just a little bit, I hold that like it's a newborn baby and I cherish it. You respect, you thank God for every revelation. That would be the second thing. The first thing uh, that we said is that faith comes by hearing, so hearing has to be vital. If you say, if you treat it hearing as eh, so-so, it's not the same. But if you want to learn how to hear from God, if I treated that word like a newborn baby and I'm bonding with it, that baby could go, uh, 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 and I would hear it in the next room. If I don't learn to bond with that word that God quickened to me, I treat it lightly or indifferent. It's a law of conditioning. If I treat it lightly, it could thunder and I wouldn't hear it. It's called a hardened heart. You're gospel, you can be gospel hard. You can know the right answers, but you can't tell when that sweet, cherishing, loving voice is attached to it because of a lack of intimacy, a lack of relationship. So it's got to be vital, number one. Number two, you need to cherish or, in simple language, thank Him for every revelation. Every quickened scripture, thank Him. At least humble yourself and be grateful. Because then you can be rewarded with a grateful heart. Thirdly, meditate on it. And when I said cherish, Jennifer didn't quite get it. But she said, you mean absorb. I go, yes, absorb, assimilate. Take something that God has said and don't think that the minute you know it in your head, you're done. God wants to expand it in your heart and inform your head of some things that you didn't know. But that takes a little bit of time. And so meditate on it. Then what I learned to do was, and sometimes it didn't even really fit, but I enjoyed doing it, was I would find a way to first, before I applied it to someone else, you know, people like to give words to other people. First, they say, apply it to yourself. Take your prophetic words and make sure you're living them. <laughs> apply it to you, and then you've got out of the overflow of your reality, you're giving life to somebody else. Don't prematurely give life to somebody that hasn't even impacted you yet. It's going to be like dead letter. You want it to be alive, it needs to be, 
you need to be a partaker of that divine nature so that you express reality and anointing. Now, apply it to your life, commit yourself to do it and live by it. I, I, that's the fifth thing. I commit myself that I'm not giving up on holy expectation until I feel like God says it's done. If it's not done, I don't want to quit. I'm going to stay on that topic. And you're going to think I'm going senile because I'm repeating myself over and over again. But it feels so good to repeat myself because it's going deeper and deeper and deeper. It's like, it's like my heart is like jello and God pours hot boiling water. It's going to cut deeper and deeper and deeper and that's okay. So repetition can be good. It can be vain repetition if it's empty, but it can be good if it's got substance. If there's substance to it, it can go deeper. Never say, oh, I already knew that. Any Christian that always makes the comment, I already knew that, probably doesn't know it yet. Because it's not about knowing at one level. It's about the depth of, of transformation. I hope I gave you all the numbers right. One, it's vital. This is for the note takers. Two, thank Him for every revelation. Three, meditate. Four, apply it to yourself. Five, commit to live by it. And six, oh, listen to this one. Do not rush ahead and reason everything out. <laughs> I can remember how the Lord taught me that one. I, he would go, quick in a scripture, like, out of your belly flows. I, out of your belly flows. There's a river that makes glad. And the anointing would decrease while I was preaching to God about everything I knew about rivers. And then I kind of got the clue that I was supposed to shut up. He wasn't done talking. And I'd go back to, there's a river. Out of my, and he would show me things in the scripture that I'd never seen before. Sometimes you've got to remind yourself that you're the student, he's the master. You don't have to preach to God. God's trying to preach something to you. And you're not the quickest, brightest bulb in the chandelier. So his method with you and I is what? A little here, a little there, line upon line, again and again. <laughs> that works. So welcome it. Thank you, God. He tells us everything. This is Isaiah 28. I'm going to close with this. We're going to seal this work today by Isaiah 28. The Lord says, He tells us everything over and over again, a line at a time and in such simple words. So the Lord will spell it out for them, repeating it ever and over in simple words whenever He can. Isaiah 28, 10 and 13. I don't know what translation that is. But it's probably the message. But he's going to say it over and over again. That's not because you know it. It's because you need to know it deeper. So Father, seal this work. And let's, let's recognize that no matter what comes your way today, the enemy wants to wear you out and God wants to reward you. So take advantage of these trials and make them opportunities to see a blessing. I'm an optimist the right way. I am not a positive thinker. I am an optimist because my hope is in God. And my confident expectation is for good, regardless of all the garbage that I see. I'm not in denial. I'm well aware of all the negativities. I'm well aware of the problems. But my God will always remain the number one solution, and He's your number one solution. Any other solution apart from Him is a diversion. And it's false wisdom. It's ungodly. Yeah. So, Father, seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bring us to fruition, all the good things that you've planned for us. And for the visitors, first and second time visitors, I want to create in you a hunger for more. Because more is what God is going to do in the days ahead. For the, for the King of Glory is going to come. And He wants you to say, open ye gates and let the King of Glory in. There needs to be a new fresh openness. There needs to be a death to a negativity, a death to temper tantrums, and a death to uh, meltdowns. If you're engaging in any of those, you're listening to the wrong voice. That is not God. He don't talk like that, and He don't act like that. The new creation, you that loves God and loves His Word, doesn't respond like that. Let's get better at that. 
I blew all of those areas. But I'll tell you what, I learned from them how not to do them. So can you. So let's move on to perfection. Let's move on to maturity in the days ahead. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.